April 1777. The Connecticut colony and the rest of the fledgling United States has been at war with Great Britain for two years. Vital resources on both sides are critical for the survival of troops and have run low for the British in New York. Danbury, Connecticut attracts the attention of British spies due to the patriot cache of tents and foodstuffs. General William Howe decides to launch a raid on the supply depot to capture as many resources as possible. It begins with a sea landing. My name is Nicole Carpenter, Programs and Collections Director at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. Join me on a jaunt through Westport to go through the local involvement during the American Revolution's Danbury Raid, which began and ended in this New England town. Most Westporters recognize the name of the Danbury Raid, and many may be familiar with the 1955 painting Landing at Campo Beach by Robert Lambden. The British force of 1,800 troops under the command of Major General William Tryon landed at Cedar Point to begin their raid on April 25th. However, Lambden's painting is misleading. The British regulars and some 300 Loyalist volunteers landed here at Cedar Point, not on a sunny day, but between 6 and 8 p.m. in the evening, in weather conditions described as lightly showery squalls by Henry Duncan, a captain in the Royal Navy and commander of naval operations during the raid. Not only was the weather rainy, but the temperature was dropping into the 40s. Archibald Robertson, Tryon's engineer, described the landing, which was met with no resistance. The troops came on shore in great order and were all quickly landed. Soon after dark, the beach was all cleared and every person sent to their own ships. Though there was no Patriot opposition, Brigadier General Gold Selleck Silliman, commander of Connecticut's 4th Militia Brigade, did receive timely word of the landing and immediately raised troops. Generals Benedict Arnold and David Worcester received the call from Silliman while stationed in New Haven and immediately began their journey to Danbury. On the first evening, Silliman reported about 50 militiamen with about 20 Continental soldiers were posted along the road from Greens Farms Meeting House to the Sagatuck River. A small skirmish happened this night between a few of this party and the enemy. Advised three of the enemy were badly wounded. It was here that the first action was seen during the raid and was described by the British as well, though describing the Patriots as a few skulking people. Over the day, both British and Patriot troops made their way through Reading towards the magazine in Danbury through heavy showers and wind. On the 26th, around 4 p.m., the British arrived in the town and were met by a force of 200 rebels who were quickly put down. By that evening, the British were well aware of the Patriot force following behind them, and with the lack of local support and aid of wagons to transport any supplies, decided to burn the depot. Early the next morning, the British left Danbury to return to Long Island by way of their ships on Cedar Point, but with Patriot pressure, made their way towards Ridgebury and Ridgefield. General Worcester and Arnold, who joined the Patriot lines, split their forces. Worcester engaged with the British's flank as they fled, but was mortally wounded. Later in the day, on the 27th, Patriot barricades were erected in the town of Ridgefield as the Patriots had reached the town prior to the British. There, the two sides engaged in the Battle of Ridgefield, which ended with the Patriot forces being driven south towards Wilton. Sunday, April 28th, the British began their final push towards the beaches of Westport, with the knowledge that the Patriots' retreating forces stood between them and their goal. Fair weather aided the British on their march, as well as the Patriot effort to muster troops. Benedict Arnold used the evening of the 27th to rouse support from the local communities to swell their numbers. By 10.30 a.m., their numbers were around 700. Silliman reported by the end of the day, the number rose to 4,000. With the expanded Patriot force, an artillery position was taken here on Old Hill to guard what was then the only bridge on the country road, today King's Highway. 
In comparison, the Patriots could see two to three miles along Wilton Road. By 11 a.m., they had their guns trained on Poplar Plains and waited. But the British had an ace up their sleeve with the Prince of Wales Royal American Volunteers, 300 men loyal to the crown with intimate knowledge of the local area. These Tories gave the British an alternate plan and a route that would completely avoid Silliman and Arnold. An alternate river crossing, a low tide ford, could be found down what is today, coincidentally, Redcoat Lane. Simply crossing the ford with the entire British force would have been disaster, as it was well within Patriot sights, and would have sparked the militia into a counter move. Instead, the British decided to divide their troops into three groups. One as a diversionary force, one tasked with securing the bridge's east end, and the last group consisting of supplies, wounded, prisoners, and the remaining troops. The diversionary force made their way towards the Patriot position atop Old Hill along Wilton Road. At the same time, the remaining two groups made their way along Redcoat Lane to the ford. While the diversionary force paraded back and forth just out of cannon range, the first group to cross the ford made their way to the Sogtuck Bridge's east end to block any Patriot troops threatening to cross. The third group of British troops carrying supplies passed the bridge and began heading towards Cedar Point to make their escape. As these movements began around noon, General Arnold began to see the diversion for what it was and began to move his own force to compensate. The British diversionary force withdrew to the ford as the Patriots shifted towards the bridge. With the British supplies and the diversionary force slipping past the bridge, the race was on. By 1 p.m., the British completed their escape from the bridge and raced to Cedar Point. Captain Duncan, on board the Eagle, described that he, quote, saw the advanced guard of the army coming down the hills at a distance, the rebels harassing their rear with one gun and musketry from every stone fence. The British supplies made their way down Hills Point Road, arriving at the beach by 2 p.m., while the diversionary force and bridge troops came down Compo Road south. By 3 p.m., positions were taken atop Compo Hill in preparation for the Patriots, who followed closely behind. Benedict Arnold led his force after the British, also splitting his troops to follow along Campo Road and Hills Point. The general stayed along the Western Road. Contemporary accounts described Arnold as leading with bravery, coolness, and fortitude. Both sides came in contact at Campo Hill, with British grenadiers, large grenade and bayonet-wielding troops, turning the Patriots back, marking the last action seen during the raid. It was during the combat at Campo that First Lieutenant Samuel Elmer was killed in action. While serving in Colonel Elmore's battalion as a First Lieutenant, Elmer was most probably killed during a bayonet charge between 3.30 and 5 p.m. He's buried here at Green's Farms Lower Cemetery when he could not be buried at home. His family inscribed his epitaph. Our youthful hero, bold in arms, his country's cause, his bosom warms, to save her rights, fond to engage and guard her from a tyrant's rage, flies to ye field of blood and death and gloriously resign his breath. Robertson wrote of the action on the beach. We drove them back a great way, killing considerable numbers. After this, they never more advanced and we embarked on board our ships without a shot being fired. By 9.30 p.m., the British had successfully begun their journey back to New York. These cannons were donated by the U.S. government in 1901, dedicated on July 1st, roughly at the point where the British landed and disembarked in 1777. Today, they are a favorite for children and beachgoers alike. Just down the road is a second monument commemorating the actions of local Sculpted by Harry Daniel Webster and cast by Tiffany Studios in 1910, the Minuteman statue celebrates the men who took part in the action seen in Westport. Its plaque reads, To commemorate the heroism of the patriots who defended their country when the British invaded this state April 25, 1777. General David Worcester, Colonel Abraham Gould, 
and more than 100 Continentals fell in the engagements, commencing at Danbury and closing on Campo Hill. With this dedication, remember the men who lost their lives during the raid. Not only the militiamen, but also the British soldiers who traveled across the sea, as well as the women, native peoples, black enslaved, and freemen who fought on both sides of the conflict. With this collective understanding of the importance of the revolution, the fight for freedom can begin to 